hello. Ah, thank you. Uh, gosh, after hearing that, I think, God, what a show off. <laughs> Um, no, yeah, well, uh, anyway, lovely to be here. Um, so it was kind of demanding, that, uh, actually, to think about what I was going to talk about without sounding depressing. Uh, my field in policy, international relations, is a lot of good stuff, but humans being what humans are, we tend to make the same mistakes. And so in the spirit of TED Talk, I tried to find something I could speak about which would be something with a solution at the end, shall we say, especially recently, given all the activity with the Crimean uh, situation in Russia and the kind of almost return to the Cold War feeling we have. So I'm going to go back 10 years first. Uh, 10 years ago, I was teaching English in Japan. And uh, I loved the country. I had a wonderful time, amazing students. Um, they were all really well behaved. They used to bow to me every morning, which I loved. <laughs> <laughs> and um, anyway, we had a great rapport. Uh, and you know, one day they went off, it was a Friday, they went off to Hiroshima to go on a school trip to the Hiroshima Peace Park. And uh, if you haven't noticed already, I'm an American. This is relevant. They came back on the Monday, and um, something had shifted. <laughs> something had changed. They were not as happy and smiley as they had been when they went off. And I, I kind of didn't get it at first. I'm a you know, young teacher, want to be liked. And, and they were kind of looking at me with disappointment in their eyes, and I realized suddenly, oh, I get it. They've just seen this kind of, the horror of Hiroshima. And it, it really hit me. And my initial reaction, to be absolutely honest with you, I was emotionally, at first I felt their pain, and then I felt angry. I was like, you know what? Hold on a second. Uh, you guys aren't the victims. How about the Chinese, or the Koreans, or us when Pearl Harbor? I had that emotional reaction, and essentially, what I realized just seconds after I had that first reaction was that their world and my world had kind of collided. Up till then, we just kind of exchanged just personal relations, but that our stories that we'd been given, our kind of national narratives that we'd been socialized into, me in an American high school and them in their Japanese high school, that some of these stories contradicted each other. Their spirits were not the same. Because I can tell you, when I studied uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, you know, we didn't feel bad about it. We weren't taught to feel bad about it. We were taught that this was the kind of way that war had to end, that it was somehow justified, that it hadn't been a good thing, but it had been a necessary thing. And I had to step back from wanting my narrative to be right. This is ultimately the truth of politics. Basically, politics, everyone, I think, will agree that politics is a nasty word, but essentially, politics is when you have two people who want different stuff, and they have to figure out how to negotiate that. It's essentially about groups of human beings who compete, either for resources and sometimes for narratives and ideas. And it was kind of a great experience for me in the end. In fact, that's why I'm telling it now, because I stepped out of my own narrative. I stepped out of being John Hemmings, the American guy, and this was our story. And I stepped into their story and what they were doing. And I kind of also realized that there was this, these things called stories that we all have, that we all kind of pick up. And we don't really realize we're picking it up, but when you're going to school, the incredible thing is you can go into a biology classroom or a math classroom, and if you have to, you know, it's kind of difficult. <laughs> but going into a history classroom is a different event. And this is kind of what I want to leave you with tonight. Going into a history classroom, and some of you are probably historians, so you know what I'm talking about, it's, a, it's an act of creation. You were going into a room that some people have thought, at some level, you know, who are we? Who are the British? Or who are the Americans? And they have created, not created out of thin air, but they have edited, they have focused on certain events which they think reflect on their society. And this is a pretty, I think, obvious thing, but I suppose why I'm talking about it tonight is that it's occurred to me, I, I left education and I went to go into to policy, I was a think tanker in uh, Whitehall for many years and then in the US for a bit. And I, my focus, of course, having lived in Japan and loved it, was East Asia. And, you know, lucky for me, China happened to be rising. You know, I was like, oh, <laughs> that's handy. Uh, and I also, things like Korea, uh, North Korea kept, you know, happening. The situation in North Korea was not getting better. Um, and so I found myself kind of drawn into these struggles between different groups of people. And also, if you don't know much about the region, you may not know that the Americans are very involved and have been very involved in diplomatic and military and security ways in the region for, since the end of World War II. Uh, we are in 
the region, if, whether we like it or not. So being in Japan, coming back out of it, and it gave me some time to reflect on the nature of not only history being taught, but nationalism itself. And before I kind of go into the spiel about nationalism, what I want to do first is defend nationalism. Because actually, nationalism itself is not a bad thing. Um, nationalism is essentially a, a coherent mythology for large groups of human beings to kind of accept each other. If you were in, if I, I understand from anthropologists, of, of one of which I am not, that the kind of normal sized human group in the wild would have been about 60 individuals, most of them related to each other. Uh, Francis Fukuyama calls this the kin group. We would have been kind of chasing bison and, and hunting and gathering. And you have the agricultural revolution. Suddenly you have food surplus. Populations grow, humans become uh, sedentary. sedentary, sedentary. They, they start to locate in one place. And when that happens, you know, the numbers of people go up, and you have all sorts of institutions have to happen so that people don't kill each other, people don't compete. You have kind of rule, uh, rule of law. You have uh, policing, the military, so that there's law, some sort of way of preventing people from taking each other's stuff. But you also have, over time in Europe, but also other parts of the world, kind of myths grow up so that we can hang out with each other without competing, that, that bind us together. And they're usually not a bad thing, to be honest. For a state like Britain, say that group of 60 individuals, there's 60 million of you, and you're kind of doing fine, actually. I mean. Now, it doesn't always look that way when it's raining, but to be honest, um, it's an incredible thing. It's kind of a miracle when you think that uh, China, for example, has 1.2 billion people who are organizing themselves as a nation state. It's, it's kind of a miracle of humanity that we're able to create these narratives and these myths to ourselves to figure out how to cooperate together and how to do a lot of great stuff together. But fast forward to uh, now, to where I guess I've been uh, in the last few years in terms of what I've been studying. And I've been looking at, I suppose, the region, East Asia, and what's happening there, and the incredible miracle of the rise of China uh, to become the, the world's second largest uh, economy. Uh, and it's just been this incredible thing, and probably, I think, the largest shift of, um, I think, the largest historical shift. You probably have all heard this in a lot of other TED Talks, but probably in the last 400 years. Uh, and certainly 430 million um, people have been lifted out of poverty think so as well. We're living through an amazing, incredible time. But there's a lot of kind of repercussions from that. And as those people have risen, I'll tell you kind of briefly how it looks from, from here. Essentially, you had the Chinese were for many, many centuries kind of the, the beneficiaries of uh, culture and language and writing. and they we're able to extend these things to other countries like Japan and Korea. And those countries were kind of within a kind of satellite system of the, Japanese, of the Chinese empire. Japan was able to modernize first due in the 1800s due to its contact with the West. And it was able to use the kind of means and techniques of the West to kind of break that natural order. And to be honest, uh, also to subjugate the other two to its own kind of colonial ambitions, which unfortunately, it mirrored on, on British, American, and, and other Western empires. That was a kind of great injustice. So the story I'm about to tell you, or the story that I've been telling you, is kind of starts with injustice, this moment of many, many uh, million Chinese and Koreans that suffered under World War II. And although we fast forward to where we're now, now uh, here in you know, 2014, those countries have risen, and Japan doesn't look so hot to them. You know, they're kind of unhappy. There's a lot of... Um, resentment and anger. And on Japan's side, there's a lot of fear. And unfortunately, you're seeing these, I'm sure you've seen them, the textbook controversies that are happening. And this is why I'm talking about it. For me, this is, it is an issue that's happening, um, you know, faraway peoples, uh, about whom we know little, as uh, Chamberlain once said. But actually, th these people's lives have very direct impact on our lives. Everyone in this room would be deeply impacted by uh, these countries due to their global prominence. Um, about a year ago, uh, to, yeah, February 2012, um, there's a group of islands that are contested by China and Japan. And a Chinese frigate was sailing around in a Japanese destroyer. And this was kind of, you know, posturing. Uh, nothing dangerous, but the two countries trying to show through 
military sim symbolism, who really belonged there. And to the Chinese, it wasn't as simple as just these islands are ours. These islands represented things that had been taken from them by the Japanese back in 1940. And to the Japanese, this was, you know, if we let this ta get taken away from us now, how are they going to behave next? So behind these tiny little uninhabited islands about which there's not much going on, there was like these symbolisms and deep meanings behind it. So the frigate captain of the Chinese boat essentially lights up the Japanese vessel with his radar system and his weapon system, which basically is really like, almost like p picking up a loaded gun and pointing at someone. The act is threatening. The act is a really interesting act. It's a horrible act, and it's not illegal, but it's certainly against good naval tradition. What happens in the Japanese bridge when the sensors and the radar systems pick that up is that all these alarms go off. And I'm sure the Japanese captain, I'm, I'm guessing here, would have had two things on his mind. The responsibility to protect his men and the idea that he may have to respond in kind. If he had responded in kind, we would have been at one of those kind of fatal, fatal moments when you know, the Archduke of um, Franz Ferdinand was shot. You know, one of those moments where you think two countries that didn't mean to go to war do it because one man has picked up a gun. And luckily for us, I think, to be honest, the Japanese captain sailed away. Um, this is, you know, you can find this in the South China Morning Post, and there's lots of articles around it. It's one of those little ones that didn't get a lot of press in the West, so don't worry if you don't remember it. <laughs> There'll be a quiz afterwards. And I just remember thinking, oh my God, you know, these two guys for a moment had pretty much all of our destinies in their hands. If I remind you, this was the world's second largest economy and the world's third largest economy just about to accidentally have a war in which the first largest economy, the US, is a treaty ally of one of those countries and obliged militarily to defend it if there's a conflict. Um, and so when I say history and nationalism being taught in classrooms is important, I'm not saying that that incident took place because of it, but I am saying that the context, the environment in which that captain had grown up, in which post-1989, there was a lot of um, patriotic education, shall we say, in China. It happens everywhere, and what I'm trying to say is that, yes, we can give peace a chance, but we actually have to look back at how we begin to view each other as enemies. How do discourses get raised? How does a child who knows nothing about the world think to himself, well, you know, the Japanese are my enemy because of what they've done? They are taught that. We are all taught that. I'm, I'm only using Japan and China as examples. Really, this is really relevant to all of us, with Michael Gov in this country doing his attempt at reforming history. And of course, every country is going to have good and bad stuff. There are going to be empires that you've done, and there's going to be also great accomplishments. And I think the challenge for all of us, this is like the hard part, especially for me as an American, <laughs> is um, you know, you, you have to kind of think critically. Yes, we did good stuff. And then you have to realize, but yes, we did bad stuff. And somehow be able to comprehend that. And you have to work with other countries and have shared agreements on what happened. And that's very difficult because it's very politicized. People don't like it. Nationalism comes in two directions. It's either top down, uh, the state writes the textbook for you to read, or it's bottom up. There's a lot of people who are very excited about their country and want all of us to be very excited about it. And that's okay, like I said before, that's all right. But it's not good when it tells you who your enemies are. And it's even worse when they say, this land, this island here has been ours from time immemorial, and thus it's worth fighting for. So many of the things that I've looked at, so many of the conflicts that are happening right now, say in the Balkans or in Crimea, are about these narratives that this was ours, it was always ours and it shall be ours forever. Um, the great example, I suppose, of this is Kosovo. Uh, during the 90s, you may remember, that was a huge battle. There weren't even many Serbs in Kosovo, but the, the identity of Serbia was that Kosovo was kind of part of the Holy Land, um, Holy Land metaphorically. So what can we do about it? What do I suggest? Um, we have to avoid going from these two scenes to going to this scene. And how can we do that? Well, first, you're probably thinking to me, is war really possible? And actually, um, I don't mean to kind of come here and tell you it is, but I'm going to do that. <laughs> I hate to do that because it's a TED talk, but I have to do it because that's, you know, it's, it's, it's good value. It's, you know, the why weren't we warned type of thing. Um, in 1913, 
people may not have thought that um, war was possible. In fact, they didn't. That's the weird thing is, if you look at one of the most popular books ever published before 1914, it's a 1910 book up here, uh, Norman Angel's um, The Great Illusion. He argues that we are too interdependent through trade and that we uh, have so much globalization and not only that, war is so terrible, the weapons of war are so horrifying, that people just wouldn't do it. <laughs> does it sound familiar? It really does to me, actually. It sounds exactly what I think when I think of Russian tanks going into Ukraine. Yeah, would they do that? Who would do such a thing? And again, I'm not arguing that the history and the nationalism that are taught in classrooms leads to war, but it certainly helps. It helps, it lends itself to leaders pulling us into things that we don't want to be doing. When Putin announced that Crimea was going to be Russian, um, after years and years of patriotic Russian education, 77% of Russia, uh, sorry, his popularity rose up to 77% that he was annexing this bit of territory. So it does, it does contribute. We need to start somewhere. This was my kind of puzzle, how to say something that was positive to you. There are things that are happening, suggestions that I, I'd like to leave you with, which is kind of the upbeat moment. <laughs> like, yes, you may stop crying now. Um, essentially, you know, if history might be not all of the problem, but part of the problem in how we teach it and how we separate ourselves from the opponents, joint textbooks. This is a crazy idea that the French and Germans have been doing since the 60s, and you can understand why. I mean, 150 years, the Germans and the French have had issues. <laughs> and those issues have sometimes involved all of us in the world, funny enough. Um, it is possible, and, and some countries are trying it. It's incredible. In Southeast Asia, they're trying to do it. Um, the J Japanese and the Koreans have tried to do it. In 2002 to 2005, they got very close. Again, this is politically sensitive stuff. People uh, eventually pulled the plug on that project, which I would love to see it revived because I think it's deeply necessary. There are issues that are problematic about it. States that write these textbooks don't like to have other things shown. And that's one of the hard things, and I, I suspect there's a little bit of a cultural element to this, that if you're a Confucius state, you maybe you have issues about talking about your ancestors in a negative light. I think we forget maybe in the West that one of the great things about Christianity is you can kind of say, well, like, it's, you know, it's not my fault, or, or, or yes, it was my fault, uh, my ancestors' fault, and then I, you know, I confess, and that's the sin. So more military exchanges. We could get officers going to each other's places and actually getting to know each other as individuals. There is a little bit of that going on, but it, it always gets frozen every time there's a political conflict. And finally, student exchanges. I know this sounds really, really um, like not so important, but it's super, super important um, to get as many kids going abroad and learning each other's narratives and learning that they aren't necessarily enemies. So with those kind of few suggestions, I hope I've maybe giving you a little bit of something to think about, a little bit provocative, and thank you for your time.